Okay, so for chapter six on functions, uh, basically our learning objectives are to learn about the fundamentals of functions, function components and calls, uh, composition. Uh, basically we have different options, nest, save as intermediate or use my grid. Uh, we are going to cover where and when functions are looking for values, how are arguments being evaluated, and how special arguments dot dot work, and ways of exiting, types of returns, errors, and exit handlers. And then if we have time, also function varieties. Uh, so as for the fundamentals, so basically functions are objects, just like vectors are objects. Uh, Give me two seconds. And function components are basically three, right? So the arguments, the body, and the environment, except for primitive functions in C. So the components are formals, which is a list of arguments that control how we're calling the function. Then we have the body, uh, which is code inside the function, and environment, uh, basically the data structure determining how the values associated with the names are found. Uh, as for how you specify it, basically, so formals and body are specified explicitly when you create a function, by the, but the environment is specified implicitly, so based on where you define the function, right? So we have this example of F02 function, and then by calling formals on it, you get the list of arguments, the arguments are X and Y, and then by calling body, we can see that the comment was not printed, and here is the body of the function. And then by calling environment on the function, we get that it's only printed when the function is not defined in the, in the global environment, right? And then, I mean, uh, there is a, a section covering primitive functions, which are like sum or the, the brackets, and they exist, primar they exist prim primarily in C. So the calls above for them are all null. This is important when you try to check what arguments a function is using or what is uh, its body. But you can use is.primitive to check if an object is a primitive function. And so, I mean, as for attributes, like all objects in R, because functions are objects, they can uh, possess any number of additional attributes. And one attribute used by base, by base R is uh, SRCREF. Uh, for source reference. And unlike body, it contains the comments of the function. So, I mean, if you call attributes on F02, on this function that you we were seeing with the uh, option, uh, with the argument frcref, uh, you get the comment that was in the function, but it wasn't being printed before. So yeah, basically those are the fundamentals, right? Functions are objects and their components are arguments, body, and environment, and you call it like this. Um, then we have a section on first class uh, functions. And basically, since our objects, since our functions are objects in their own right, uh, this is a property that is called first class functions. You can always use is.function to test if an object is a function. And you can create functions binded anonymously or via a list. So uh, when, when, when you're binding, basically you just uh, have the function object and you bind it to a name with an assignment operator. There is no special syntax uh, for creating a function in, in this way, like, unlike our languages. And when you, when you create them anonymously, uh, this, I mean, you, it can be useful, yes, to, to do it anonymously, not bind to a name. Uh, when you don't want to do all the effort of figuring out uh, a name, for instance. And some examples of anonymous functions are, let's say, when you do a lot apply on, on, on empty cars and you're trying actually to use a function of length of the unique values of each column, finding the unique values in each column. This function now doesn't have a name, right? Um, yeah, another example that is given there is about uh, calculating an integral. And yes, then, I mean, uh, the thing is, how do you call anonymous functions? Uh, basically, you use extra parentheses to separate the, the function call from the anonymous function's body. So when you have this anonymous function, function of x3, I mean, you don't call it like this. 
uh, you call it using uh, the brackets. And a good rule of thumb is that anonymous functions should fit in one line and they shouldn't need to use curly brackets. We are not using curly brackets here to define this type of function here. And then a final option, a final option uh, when creating functions is listing them to put uh, to put them all in a list. So, for instance, example here is you create the the this this object that is uh, a, a list, and it contains your functions. This one is doing the half of x, and this one is uh, doubling. And then you can call it the functions like this by accessing the 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 the, the function, the list. Uh, so in R, you will see functions that are called closures. They reflect the fact that our functions uh, capture or enclose their environments. And a reminder is that a function like any object can have zero, one, or many names, uh, but a name always points to one object. This was one of the exercises in, in this uh, section uh, of the chapter in Fundamentals. Uh, so yeah, uh, a reminder to chapter two, I think it is. Uh, we can always use identical F1 and F2 uh, to find if the functions are equal. And you can use much fun with your function name to find your function if you want to, to find it. Uh, yes. Yes, I think this was related to an exercise I was asking, if you have the name of the function, how do you find it or the other way around? So it was a reminder of uh, what we cover in chapter two in a way. Uh, as for invocation uh, or calling the functions, I think, uh, there are basically two ways. You can place the function uh, arguments wrapped in parentheses after the name. So for instance, here we are invocating the function mean uh, and the arguments is this sequence. And we are calling it with the option of removing an ace. But we can also use a uh, do call that it has two arguments, the, the function that you want to call and at least with the function arguments. So for instance, here we are placing the arguments inside a list and we use do call to call the means function using those arguments. Uh, the second section was about composition. And basically, R provides three ways to compose multiple function calls. You can nest, you can save the outputs of the functions as intermediates. This is all in base R, or you can use a magreter ma ma within the tidyverse ecosystem. Uh, so the example that uh, is given in, in this section is that you want to say, say you want to compute the population standard deviation using square root and mean as building blocks. So you have your function square, that is squaring things, and you have the deviation, and you have some random data. So one option would be, let's say, to, to, to nest, to, to compose multiple function calls. You can do square root of the mean of the square of the deviation. And the advantage of this is that it's concise and it's well suited for short sequences. But for longer sequences, this will be hard to read because uh, they are read inside out and right to left. So that makes it a little bit difficult. Uh, and our option would be to save it as intermediate. So we calculate the, the deviation, we calculate the squares, the mean, and then the square root of that, right? So, uh, but, uh, and, and the advantage of this is, I mean, the disadvantage in a way is that it requires you to name intermediate objects, but this can be a strength when the objects are important. Uh, but this is a weakness when the values are truly intermediate. So yeah. And I mean, yeah, it takes also more lines, right? Because we compute here the deviation, then we do the square of that first line, then we do the mean of the previous one. So yeah. 
And then we can go via Magrid using the binary operator pipes. Uh, we can have the data and we do first, we apply to it the deviation, we apply to that the square, we apply the mean. Uh, the advantage of this is of using the pipes is that you can focus on the high level composition of functions rather than in the low level flow of the data. And the focus here is on what is being done, the verbs, rather than on what's being modified, the nouns. It's nice that you can read straightforward left to right, and it doesn't require you to name intermediates, but you can only use it with linear sequences of transformations of a single object. And of course, this also requires an additional uh, third party package, right? Uh, then the other section is on lexical scoping. Um, I don't know if you have any questions, comments, if I'm moving too fast, too slow. Uh, no, uh, that, just on the, uh, that there is a, the native pipe. Yes, true. Outside of the Magrit library. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Should I keep going? Yeah, I think this has been great. I think that this section um, I might appreciate a little slower, but the other ones um, I thought were great, but this one seems super important and less familiar to me personally. Okay, just uh, please do stop me because I think well, sometimes I'm a little bit worried and afraid of the time because we have this time constraint that is a very long chapter, but I mean, I'm happy to- Oh yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> then, then go where, yeah, talk fast and I'll, I'll interrupt if I, if I get lost. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so uh, as for lexical scoping, uh, basically, I mean, yeah, I'm going to be focused on uh, uh, looking for values. Uh, so scoping is the act of finding the value that is associated with a name. So chapter two was about the, the act of binding the name to the value uh, and now uses lexical scoping. It will look up the values of names uh, based on how a function is defined, not how is it called. And the scoping rule that it uses is called parse time rather than runtime. Run I'm not familiar very much with the differences here, to be honest. Uh, and basically, uh, he says that R follows four primary rules when in terms of uh, scoping. Uh, name masking. Uh, functions versus variables, a fresh start principle, and dynamic lookup. So name masking is that basically names defined inside a function are masking names that are defined outside a function. So here, for instance, we have uh, x and y defined outside a function, and here we have a function that is defining x and y inside, and it's returning just the, 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 the binding of both. And when you call this function, it will return uh, one and two. It's uh, it's again. It's the the names are uh, defined inside the function are masking the ones that are outside. I <laughs> uh, if a name isn't defined inside a function, R will go and look one level up. So basically, here we have x defined outside as a two. And here we have this function that is uh, binding x and y. And when you call it, uh, x takes value of two because it couldn't find it inside, right? It's not the inside. And then for y, it takes a value of one. And of course, I mean, this hasn't changed the previous value of y that was defined outside the function. When you go and check what's the value of y, y is still uh, 20 the one that was here. And the same rule applies if a function is defined inside another function. So here we have a function g, j, g, g, g4, g of four, that actually has inside a function called i. And here when you call g of four, 
you get this result. I need to check it again because I don't remember by heart how this goes. But so for instance, uh, it starts right inside, right? So I have set and I have this combination and it's going to be using this value of Y that is two and this value of Z that is three. And then it will go all the way up to try to find one and then it will return one, two, three. So basically uh, first R is looking inside a current function then it will look uh, where that function uh, was defined and so and so on. It keeps going all the way up and uh, up to the global environment. And finally, it will look, it will look in other loaded packages. So that was the rule of uh, name masking. Uh, Then there is another rule for how do you deal with uh, functions versus variables. So say that you have a function and a non-function that are sharing the same name. Uh, of course, for this to happen, they must reside in different environments. So for instance, you have this function G9, uh, but then you have this G9 as a 10 inside uh, another function, right? And then you're calling G9 on G9, uh, that's the return of, of G10. So when you call G10, it gives you 110. So because when I call G10, uh, this is G10, and it will apply G9 on G9. So it will apply, here I will get a 10, and it's G9 on 10. G9 on 10 is 100 plus 10. So that's why I get this. 110. Uh, and when you use a name in a function call, R will ignore all non-function objects when looking for that value. And yeah, of course, the clarification here after this example, it was for the record using the same name for different things is confusing and it's best avoided, but I think it was an interesting example. Uh, so yeah. R will be ignoring all non-function objects while looking for, for that value. Um, is, are, am I going okay, Rebecca, or? Yeah, sorry, this is great. I Yeah, this is great, thanks. Great, let me know if not. Um, so uh, about the fresh start uh, rule. The, that rule is basically that a function has no way to tell what happened uh, what happened the last time it was run. So each invocation is independent. So the example is here, a G11 function. Uh, and yeah, basically you call it twice and uh, the result doesn't change. Every time a function is uh, called, a new environment is created to host the new execution. So basically this function J11, J, G, G, G11, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, is checking whether if it doesn't exist A, uh, so I'm trying now to remember the comments that I put there to, to make things clear when I was writing it. Uh, when it doesn't exist A, evaluate, when it doesn't, it doesn't happen that exists A evaluates to true. Now, if this, if this condition not exists and evaluates to true, it will enter here, and that means A is one. But then, of course, when A exists, it will return uh, A plus one. And yeah, the, the return of the function is actually whatever value is for A, either one or A plus one. Uh, I think this is the last rule as for uh, lexical scoping, is that R does, di R, R does dynamic lookup. Uh, basically, is that lexical scoping determines where, but not when to look for values. So this is the, the question of when. We covered a little bit, I think, the where. Uh, I got a little bit confused on why, actually, then this was within the, the lexical scoping uh, section, I think. But, but yeah, basically, I mean, it, it, we have covered so far uh, where to, it's looking for values, but not when is it looking for values. And R looks for values when the function is run, not when the function is created. 
uh, and these two things together mean that the output of a function can differ depend depending on the objects that are outside the function's environment. So basically here we have a G, 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 G12, oh my God, I'm having problems with the letters. <laughs> G12 function. Uh, and uh, what was it? It's X plus one. And when X is 15, this evaluates to 16. And yeah, when X is 20, G12 evaluates to X plus one. So 21. Yes. So yeah, basically the objects that are outside the function's environment uh, will be affecting what is happening, right? So we have different results when X is 15 and when X is 20 and they are outside the function. Uh, then a typo in the function implies that you can be calling something else that is available in the environment, or if not, uh, maybe just sometimes not get an error. Uh, so this is a, a problem, let's say, or yeah, I mean, it can cause problems, let's say. So you can use uh, go tools, find globals, uh, which will be listing all the external dependencies, even unbound symbols that are within a function. So when I call code tools, find globals on G G12, uh, I get the external dependencies are a plus and an X. So here I can see that my function is relying on an X. And if I have an X in my global environment, I should be worried or knowing it, it, it's affecting my results. So a way to remove X for G12 is to change the, the function's environment to an empty end. So you do environment on G12 and I mean, you assign to it an empty environment. And then J12, uh, yeah, when you call it, it gives you an error because it couldn't find the function plus. This was interesting to me. I think that's why I put it revelation. Uh, L, -re L relies on lexical scoping to find everything from the obvious thing like mean to the less obvious uh, plus or these brackets. Uh, so yeah, so that was the scoping. Uh, any questions on this or any comments? So lazy evaluation. Uh, so in our functions, uh, function arguments are lazily, lazily evaluated. They are only evaluated when they are accessed. So for example, this code will not generate an error because X is never used here. So we have this function h1 that returns a 10. Uh, and when I call h1 with stop, this is an error, uh, I'm getting a, a 10. So yes, I'm not getting the error. Huh? Sorry, this is great, thank you. Uh, I thought that I thought that someone wanted to say something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you can include potentially expensive com expensive computations that will only be evaluated if needed. I mean, I guess that's the the bright side. Let's say. Uh, and an example, let's say to I mean, this was in the exercises regarding lazy lazy evaluation. Uh, was about short circuiting. When you're using the double um, Amber Pearson, I think it's a word in English, uh, if uh, the left-hand side evaluates to false, uh, uh, the statement will not evaluate the right-hand side because it doesn't matter. And similarly, when you use the, the or double, uh, it doesn't evaluate the right-hand side if the left if the left-hand side was already true. Uh, And then we go to power. So this, this is basically the, 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 the idea of lazy evaluation. And there are two features that are derived from lazy evaluation that are promises and default arguments. Uh, so promises uh, basically is that lazy evaluation is powered by a data structure uh, called a promise or a thunk. The components of a promise 
are an expression and an environment. So the expression is something like x plus y, which gives rise to, a to the delayed computation. And the environment is where the, this expression uh, is going to be evaluated. So the environment where the function is called. And this actually is what makes sure that the following function returns 11, not 101. Uh, so here we have a function that has, well, before we have this y, that y takes value 10. And we have this, fu this function h2. And inside a function, we have that y is defined to be 100. And the last expression to be evaluated in the function and should be the return is x plus one. Uh, so when you call h on y, the return is 11. Uh, uh, let me see what was it. Ah, yes, because I call it with y. But actually, when I call it with y, y takes value 10. So here gets the 10. And then I get it here. I don't know. I mean, I, I am highlighting things. I don't know if you can see my highlights or not. I, I forgot to ask. Yeah, we can. That's helpful. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, basically, uh, you get that the y value of 10 gets assigned to x here. And then, of course, with x equals 10, this will be returning the 11. Uh, yes. So basically, it's the promise. Uh, this is the environment part is where the expression is being evaluated and where it's being called. This also means that when you assign y inside a call, y is bound outside of the function, not inside it. So kind of like the same reasoning as above, uh, if I call it with 1,000 and I, I bind the value of y here, uh, I will be using 1,000 and the return will be the last expression evaluated and that's 1,001. Uh, but yeah, you should watch out for the y value. It's now not 10 anymore, of course. Uh, well, of course not, but yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, now it's 1,000, uh, so yeah. Y is bound outside of the function, not inside of it. Yes, outside of the function. So uh, the promise is evaluated at most once. So for instance, an example is that calculating in this uh, code will get printed only once. So there is this function that is doubling. Uh, it takes X and it's going to double X. And it prints this uh, message in console that is calculating, but it will only print it once. Uh, so when you call, when you define a function h3, oh, I got lost. Where is the double? Ah, uh, because it's calling here the double below. So then there is a function h3 that is uh, binding x and x. And when you call h3 on double 20, so double 20, it will come here. It will double the 20, it will make it a 40. And then here it's repeating that 40, right? But the, the message calculating was printed only once and it was evaluated only once, the prompt. Uh, and a comment uh, regarding promise that was there in the book also was that you cannot, I didn't fully understand this, I, or no, yeah, not exactly, but it says that you cannot manipulate promises with R code. Any attempt to inspect them with R code forces an, an immediate uh, evaluation, making the promise disappear. Uh, yes. I don't know if anyone has a comment on this. I got a little bit lost there. I don't know if it was just me or... <laughs> No, definitely not just you. It's weird to think about something that you can't um, dig into at all. I think also, yeah, the, the, uh, maybe the, the text okay. at this point was something about quantum states. The promises are like quantum states, and then I got a little <laughs> bit confused, yeah. Uh, well, and then, I mean, uh, we go into default arguments, because basically this is started by saying there are two features derived from lazy evaluation. 
evaluation promises and default arguments, uh, default arguments uh, in that part, uh, the, co the, uh, the, 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 the covering of default arguments started with saying that thanks to, to the lazy evaluation, the default values can be defined in terms of other arguments or variables that are defined later in the function. So the example is this H4. And actually, so some are within uh, the, the arguments are defined uh, in, a, in, in, in the function here, but then inside in the body. How was this? And this is H4. Um, yeah. So basically, when I call H4, it will take this value of x as default. Y is, of course, then 1 times 2, that's 2. And then Z is A plus B. So yeah, they are defined later here. And that's perfectly fine. That's 110, the addition. So yeah. Here we have this example that I was saying it very default values. These are uh, so the default values here, they can be defined in terms of other arguments like y, which is defined in terms of x, or they can be defined by some variables that are later here in the function like a and b. Uh, many base are functions use this technique, uh, but Hadley says that doesn't recommend it because the code is harder to understand. It's difficult to basically it's difficult to predict what will be returned, and you need to know the exact order of evaluation of the arguments. Uh, and while default arguments are evaluated, is I think this was interesting also that default arguments are evaluated inside a function that you have that the user supplied once uh, have a different evaluation environment. So, for instance, here we have a function that the default value is an empty list. Uh, and here I have uh, a is one and x. And this is the last thing. So when you call the function like this, uh, without uh, the user supplying something, uh, it will return uh, a and x. So, but when you call it uh, with uh, ls, uh, you get that the function is, you get the return of H5. I think that my reasoning here was something like uh, calling the function with the argument LS. So it asks to list what is in the environment at that time and that at the time you have H5. Uh, yeah, because I uh, list, sorry, it's not, this is listing what is in environment. LS is listing, what, sorry. So yeah, let me see how this goes. I, I forgot about this one. Uh, yeah, when I when I don't call it uh, asking for that, I get a and x. Without any argument, it will use the default ls, and that goes and lists the objects that are there in the environment. But when you call it explicitly with ls, it will search at this point in time when after call what is there in the environment, and I think that's why it returns h o five. <sighs> and this basically means that. Seemingly identical calls uh, can yield different results. I don't know if anyone has any comments on this or if it was clear the covering. I'm sorry, but as a, also as a, because that it's been uh, some weeks that we have done this, so I need to remember what. It's good that I left comments of what was my reasoning. I hope it's correct, but I yeah, I'm struggling to remember. <laughs> Is this okay, everyone? Or yeah, it's a, it's okay. It's a, just you know, uh, it throws uh, the 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 function name uh, as an object. Um, I really don't understand because you apply you search for a list inside the, a function, uh, and it releases the name of the function. I don't I don't get it. No, what? because it's not, I think X, so X is something that is listing everything that you have in the environment, right? And this function, whatever happens, I mean, it, should, it will return the last thing evaluated, which is X. 
So it will be listing everything that I have in the environment. I think that the thing is that, yeah. So uh, that's insane. I think that when, when I don't call it with anything, yeah, I don't know. This, it returns this, me. Yeah. The, 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 this function doesn't, uh, so um, the argument of this function is a list. Okay. And so when you don't provide a name for the argument of the function, but just the list call. This one. Is the name of, yeah, I don't. That's okay. Uh, good to know. I think it's because it's being evaluated inside. I don't know. But yeah. I think if you scroll up a little bit, I feel like um, this clarifies sort of. No. If you go up more, do you talk? Is there talk about evaluation? You scroll up a little bit more. Sorry. Uh, yeah. This. Nope. Up. Oh, there you go. Isn't it this? Where? But here we didn't call it like completely empty, right? Yeah. 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 No. So yeah. I think. Here I don't know. Somehow. It here makes a little bit of sense. A, a, a call with the default. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. So I call with the default here X. And what is uh, at the environment at that point? It will have the A1 and it will have mm -hmm. the X. It will have the A, right? I don't know. Yeah. So that, that calculation of the environment is not happening until the environment is being created within the function, right? I'll say it again. It should sound no, like I don't know. I don't know. It makes a little bit of sense, but not a lot of sense no, to me. So yeah. I'm good. If enough. Thank you. For, for, a for a moment there, I thought you had it. <laughs> I was like, repeat it. Yeah, I think it was going to help. Well, I think that, I mean, I do think it's related to the one above it, though, because of the the Z is the A and B, right? Z is the default argument, right? It's defined in the function, and Z is not calculated until after A and B are created, right? And then. Yep. Yes. You've got this listing of the all the objects in the environment and that's passed as a default argument. And a ah, and x are create a and x exist. I mean, I, I think it would be a would it be a different result if that said a and y? Yes, it would be. Okay, never mind because um would it? There is just no assignment to. Wait, is it that maybe that A was somewhere there already in the environment there? No, no, no. It just gets created inside the function. But the point is that the listing of the environmental uh, listing of the environment happens within the scope of that function, right? And then the point is if you um if you don't supply the default argument you get a different behavior because it's not limited to the scope of the oh, sorry when you supply a argument as a user the scope changes right you say if i put it here like a, a default value for a here no the no the the default value for x right Yes. That there's been a default value for X and then what it's returning for the listing of the environmental variables is limited to the scope of that function. And the point of this example, ah. right, is that it's not if instead the user passes an argument for um that function. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And the yeah. scope I mean, of what yeah. gets calculated changes. Uh -huh. Yeah, and so for the second one where the user passes that, you might get loads more uh, right. objects returned, right. right? It's just that there's it's quite an empty environment. But you're no longer getting A because it's not looking, because the environmental, the function scope, function environment gets a... Uh... Right. 
I don't know what the word for it is, but no, but I mean, ignored yeah, I mean, is temporary, I mean, whatever. No, but it's this. I mean, uh, this was an. I mean, it's, uh, this came up as an example of uh, this statement that it was saying in the book that yeah, default arguments are evaluated inside a function. So yeah, when you call it, uh, I'm sorry, with a default, but with a, using just the default value and you call it like this, it will evaluate inside a function. So what is listing is what is there in the environment. But user supplies have a different evaluation environment. So I think yeah, when you supply something. It just goes to the global environment and what is there at that time. And I think that's just a function object. I don't well, know. Or it could be a I lot of stuff like Laura said. Repeating, but I don't know. It does make sense, I think. No? <laughs> yeah. I wonder when this bites you in the butt. Huh? You wonder what? I wonder when you get in tr trouble with this. <sighs> um, yeah. I mean, I have the book here. Do you want to check something? No, 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 no. I just wonder when, like, as a user, like, when uh, writing a function and getting, uh, making some assumptions incorrect, you know, I wonder when, um, when you can have these unexpected results by virtue of, like, um, okay. this, okay. by not understanding the evaluation environment, that's all. Okay, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, maybe I mean, I'm trying to think if this is covered maybe in some exercise or somewhere later. I don't recall exactly, but... Uh... Maybe I should try to keep going and we can see. Yeah, keep going. Thank you for this. Yeah. <laughs> no, thanks for the questions. Uh, so missing arguments. Um, basically, I mean, to determine if an argument's value comes from the user or a default, you can use uh, missing. Uh, so for instance, this is, the, this is the function H6 has this default value. And actually what is returning is a list that returns you the value, but it says if it's missing or not. So uh, a call to this function without any argument, uh, so missing should be true. Uh, the function will be used the default, and you know this is not coming from the user, right? So when you call it without nothing, you get uh, true, because x is missing, uh, and the function is using this default, and that's why it's still returning a 10. But when you call it uh, with with a, not, not not an argument with a value for for that uh, uh, missing uh, will be false uh, because uh, yeah the argument and you know the argument is being used along it and it comes from the user so there is the ten there and it's actually yes so that's the use useful of missing. Um, I don't know, I think this was an interesting example. Uh, he mentions uh, how many arguments are required by a function and he takes sample. And for instance, the arguments of sample uh, is basic, are basically this here. Uh, and well, basically it makes you think that both X and size are required in the sample function, but actually if size isn't supplied, uh, missing will give you a default. Uh, and actually what he mentions is that it might have been better to you write the, the sample function uh, actually using an explicit null to indicate that size is actually not required, but it can be supplied. Uh, yeah, or, and there is the example. I don't think if you want to cover that, but, and yeah, uh, the lesson is that missing uh, is best used sparingly. So like not super often, uh, uh, yes, because yeah, uh, basically, yeah, missing, uh, when identified in sample, at, at least it will be doing that. So what about uh, special arguments? Uh, some special arguments are dot, dot. Uh, with uh, dot, 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 a function can take any number of additional arguments. In other languages, this is called uh, var args, and the functions are variadic. Uh, uh, one usage of the dot, dot, dot is, uh, I mean, not only for a function to take any sort of additional arguments, but you can use it to pass additional arguments to another function. So here we have i1. And this is uh, this function is uh, taking y and z and creating a list. Um, and then you have i2, which is uh, just a function of x and dot dot dot. 
uh, and it's taking I1 dot dot dot. Uh, and yes, here we are calling I2 with X1, Y2, and Z3. So when we call I2 uh, with X1, so X is one, and then I think it's using what is in the dot dot dots, so Y and Z, in its call to, to I01. So it's going to call I01 with YZ. YZ two and three, YZ two and three here, and it's making a list with those two. So this is what it's returning here. Um, so then about referencing with dot dot, uh, apparently with uh, dot dot n, it's possible, but rarely useful to refer to the elements of the dot dot, dot where you're passing many arguments by precision. So for instance, the example is this I3 function uh, that actually it's listing uh, uh, and it's creating these two elements first and third. And so the arguments or the varargs of this function are dot, dot, dot. Uh, and yeah, dot, dot, dot with a one and then dot, dot, dot with a three. So my understanding is that this takes the element number one of the dot, dot, dot. And this one is taking the element number three of the dot, dot. So when you call this function I3 with one, two, three, uh, yeah, basically, I mean, you can pass then again, this idea of the, dot dot, I can pass to I3 many arguments. Uh, and then what it's going to do is from the dot dot, take the, the, the first one that I'm passing to it, and this is the one, and then the R1 is the three. And that's why I get this. So, uh, another use of the dot dot is, uh, regarding storage, you can do list dot dot dot, which will evaluate the arguments and store them in a list. So for instance, this is a function uh, taking dot dot and puts dot dot in list. So when I call I4 this function with one and two, uh, yeah, it just one and two and it will list those arguments and it returns me the list of one, two. And then I didn't check this, but I there was a comment of you can check uh, our lang our lang equals to capture unevaluated arguments. Um, I haven't done that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, primary uses for the dot 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 uh, are two, and he said that we'll come back later to them in the group. Uh, but basically, if your function uh, takes a function as an argument, you may want to pass additional arguments to that other function. So for instance, uh, Laplace uh, uses the dot, dot, dot uh, to pass uh, NA remote to me. Uh, and then uh, the R use is if your function is an S3 generic, uh, you need some way to allow for methods uh, to take arbitrary extra arguments. So for example, print, and I think plot is another example, they allow for different options depending on the type of object you want to print. And you cannot pre-specify all. So in this type of functions, you will be using dot, dot, dot. Basically when it's an S3 generic. Um, the downsides of using dot, dot, dot are mainly two. Basically, so it's harder to understand for the user what can be done with a function. So for instance, apply and plot are two examples uh, because you have to explain where those dot dot arguments go. And then a misspelled argument will not raise an error. And this makes it easy for typos to go unnoticed. Uh, so this is a problem. Uh, exiting. <laughs> I might be able to make it on time. <laughs> uh, are we good? Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Exiting functions. So most functions will exit either by returning a value uh, of success or throwing an error if they have failed. So exiting covers uh, basically return values that we have we can have implicit versus explicit and visible versus invisible. 
we will briefly discuss errors and introduce exit handlers, uh, which allow you to run code when a function exits. Uh, so implicit versus explicit returns. An implicit return uh, is uh, where the last evaluated expression is the return value. So for instance, in this J1 val function, uh, we have basically, yes. I mean, the, the return is implicit. I don't have a return something. It's just the last evaluated expression, right? So for instance, if I call it with a five, uh, yes, X is uh, less than 10, so it will return me a zero. And we, if I call it with a 15, uh, it will get into the else part and it will return me a 10. An explicit return is by calling return. Uh, and then again, this is the function. And But now it's returning zeros it's here and 10 here. About visible and invisible returns. Most functions return visibly. Uh, you uh, Calling the function in an interactive con context will print the result. So for instance, this function J3, uh, that is a one, when you call it, it returns a one here. Uh, however, you can prevent this automatic printed, printing by applying invisible to the last value. And then you're returning invisibly here. But you can verify that this value actually does indeed exist. You can do three things. You can print it explicitly like this, uh, print J4. You can wrap it in parentheses, or you can use uh, with visible. And then we can see that actually J4 exists. It's a list of two values. Uh, yes. Ah, because it returns a visibility flag, this function with visible. So yeah, it, it will return you the flag, and it will return the number, the one that we had here. Where was J4? Yes, invisible one. Uh, an example of the most common way that a function will return invisibly is the assignation. So when you assign a two, it's actually returning something. It's just invisible. Wrap it in parentheses, and you will get the return. And this is what makes it possible to chain assignments. Uh, so actually, I mean, it's invisible, the return, but it's there. In A, you can do it, then do chain in B, C, D. And in general, any function that is called primarily for a side effect, like assign, print, or plot, should return an invisible value. Um, other examples of invisible returns, I think these were in the exercises, are load and write table. Um, then about the errors. Uh, if a function cannot complete its assigned task, it should throw an error with stop which immediately terminates the execution of the function. So this is J5. Uh, yes. and this is producing an error. When you call it stop, I'm an error. It stop, it's stop, it terminated the execution. An error will force you to deal with, with a problem. And basically, a yeah, thing about R is that uh, doesn't, R doesn't rely on special return values to indicate problems, I think. Yeah, yeah. return values. And yeah, maybe a brief comment on exit handler or something. And I don't know. Yeah, I, we can maybe do the next part. I mean, it's not that much about forms, maybe the R time, but yeah, maybe we can introduce exit handlers. I have two, mini, two minutes more. <laughs> so basically the exit handler is something that is run regardless of whether the function exits normally or without or with an error. So if you want to be sure that the global state is, is restored no matter how a function exits, you can use on exit. So here, for instance, we have this function J6 that actually is uh, printing hello. And then on exit is saying goodbye to us. And this will be print when you use on exit, this will be print uh, always regardless of whether there is an error or not. So you can do two, I mean, there are two calls, one that is true, uh, so effects, here, this, uh, since I'm parsing at X will be true, I'm calling it with a true. So true equal true will return a 10, no error, 10, and it's printing my goodbye. But then when I call it with a false, I, I get into the else. Uh, and yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I get the error printed, uh, but uh, still uh, I'm getting the goodbye. Uh, Yes, and apparently you need to add true here, this, 
because if you don't do it, each call to on exit will override a previous exit handler. Um, yes, and here is an example that I don't think we have time now to cover, but uh, it's about the usefulness of this on exit. That is basically that you can place, for instance, cleanup code directly next to the code that requires cleanup. Maybe we can cover this in our time. And basically, this also can create a useful pattern for running code in an altered environment. Uh, yes, and that's it. But I don't think we have time for that now. I don't know if anyone has questions, comments. Uh, I don't know if you're OK. I mean, I don't know if next week do you want to move to chapter 7, or do you want to finish exiting and we have yeah, forms, prefix and infix and I don't know. I think this isn't pretty important and I think we should finish it. Thank you for taking the chapter. It's a good one. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh yeah.